Okay, good morning, everyone. If you could turn, please, in your Bibles to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading in verse 12, and I'd like to read down to verse 19. And we're going to be thinking about the very important topic of walking in the Spirit this morning, walking in the Spirit. So it begins in verse 12, just kind of closing off the last section we considered. It says, I would they were even cut off which trouble you for brethren you have been called unto liberty only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh but by love serve one another for all the law is fulfilled in one word even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself but if ye bite and devour one another take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And we'll stop there for our reading purposes, and God will bless that reading to us. So I want you to notice just as we uh, begin this uh, section uh, verse from verse 13, that it begins with the, the connecting phrase, for. <laughs> so it's connecting with what's gone before. And so he's saying, for, uh, in, in the light of, I wish they were cut off, which trouble you. Why would he want them to, these false teachers, to be cut off? Because he says, brethren, you've been called to liberty. But they, instead of uh, allowing you to enjoy this liberty, they are wanting you to lead you back into bondage. And so that's why the connecting word for is there. They, they uh, have a message that's contrary to the one who called them. Uh, who called them to liberty and the, these false teachers are wanting to bring them back into bondage and so he says for and then again he uses that lovely term brethren uh, he believes they're really saved he's just they're in danger they're in danger of being swallowed up by false teaching and so he says for brethren and he's reminding them of this calling called to liberty called to freedom uh, it's a wonderful thing to have freedom and it's a terrible thing to give it up. It really is. And uh, I think uh, we can see it in, a, in the world. Uh, the, uh, the powers that be want to have more and more control, and they want us to have less and less freedom. Uh, but again, you can see, you can see it in, a, in the world as, a, as an example. But in the spiritual realm, too, there are always people that want to bring us into bondage, that want to, as it were, take away our freedom. And so he says, you have been called unto liberty. And we need to just enjoy the freedom we have in Christ. But he says this, only, and this is one of the problems. He says, use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. One of the problems, one of the great dangers, and one of the things that actually plays into the hands of the legalists is that there's a tendency in all of us to abuse freedom. <laughs> And so he says, brethren, be very careful that you do not use your freedom as an occasion to the flesh. Now, this word occasion here is a very interesting word. It's a military term, and it's like a base of operations. And so, you know, if an, 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 an enemy army is wanting to attack somewhere uh, what they want to do is establish a beachhead so when when uh, the allied forces were trying to get a beachhead on the normandy beaches so that they could ultimately defeat the enemy and so that's that's the thought a beachhead a base of operation but we'd say maybe to gain a foothold do not use your liberty to allow the flesh to get a foothold, uh, to have a base of operation, if you like. Uh, do not abuse your freedom to indulge the flesh. That would not be liberty. That's not what the word liberty is talking about. It, that would be license. 
Liberty and license are not the same thing. And there's so much confusion right there. A lot of people will use the cry of liberty to justify their fleshly sinful behaviors. Uh, I'm free in Christ. <laughs> and the, th the thought is this, Christ has never fr set us free to sin. He set us free from sin, not to sin, not to indulge our flesh. And so one of the one of the dangers, one of the things that always plays into the hands of the legalists is that if those that enjoy liberty begin to abuse it, and so he's, he's warning them, and he's telling them that the opposite of legalism is not license, it is genuine liberty, and so liberty is not the right to sin, or the privilege to do whatever evil my heart wants to do. In fact, that's a kind of bondage anyway. It's a bondage uh, to my sinful uh, desires. And so that's not the liberty that's in view here. Instead, this liberty is the spirit-given desire and ability to do what we should do before God. That's what it is. To, to be free to, to do the right thing before the Lord. That's the freedom we've been brought in into. And so he talks about this flesh. Maybe we should talk a little bit about the flesh. We'll be talking a lot about the flesh because it's going to be set in contrast to the spirit throughout this chapter. And so flesh, the NIV actually translates it as a sinful nature. Um, I, I think it's interesting that uh, uh, perhaps one way of describing the flesh is all that man is and is capable of as a sinful human being. All that man is and is capable of as a sinful human being, apart from the intervention of God's spirit. And so it's it's what we would be by nature, by, by our natural, since the fall, by our natural inclinations, it's what we would be without the intervention of God's spirit in our lives. And uh, man is a fallen being. And uh, uh, many of our desires come from this flesh that has dominated us for years. <laughs> and uh, and so this is the thing that we're talking about. And so in a sense, he's, he's discouraging two forms of slavery in these verses and advocating another form. And so what he's going to suggest to us is this. Uh, Use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh, because that's just another kind of slavery, but instead, by love, serve one another. And so this is the one type of slavery that he advocates, and that is uh, to serve one another. And we'll talk about that word serve in a minute. But um, we, we just want to think about the fact that um, uh, there's a lot of t mention here about different types of slavery here. And so um, there's two forms that we know of pretty well through this epistle. Slavery to sin, first of all, that he's talking about here, uh, this this flesh that dominates us. Uh, man is born in sin. We know that, don't we? Psalm 51 verse 5, uh, in sin did my mother conceive me. And so uh, we know that from children. We, we uh, Those of us that have children and now we have grandchildren, we we, we observe and we, we see we don't have to teach them to have a rebellious heart. We don't have to teach them to do wrong. It's just a natural propensity. Some of the first words out of their mouths are often no or mine or, you know, just exhibiting that that tendency to sinful self. Uh, Romans 7, 18, uh, Paul would say this, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And so, there's a slavery to sin. It's involuntary. It's terrible. We're born that way. We have that propensity. It, it's a terrible, terrible tyrant that we've dealt with since the day we were born. On the other hand, there's uh, slavery to law, this bondage to the law. That's done by choice. Uh, it's foolish and burdensome. We've learned about that. It's a yoke of bondage that they could not handle. And so on the other hand, now he suggests a slavery to one another, which is voluntary and a source of deep joy. He says, by love, serve one another. 
And so we want to just think about that. And a good uh, allusion uh, to what the thought here and perhaps the back of Paul's mind, if we go back to the book of Exodus chapter 21, Exodus 21 verses 5 and 6, and it's about a servant who has given his freedom. And so it says in verse 5, if the servant shall plainly say, this is Exodus 21, shall plainly say, I love my master my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. And so here's a beautiful picture. It's like ourselves. We we love our master. <laughs> the Lord has been so good to us. He saved us at such a high Price. And now he set us free from the, the law and its constraints. So what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to that? Well, I think it would be the appropriate response to say, I love my master. <laughs> I, I don't want to use my freedom as an occasion to the flesh. I actually want to uh, use it to, to love my master and to serve him. And not just serve him, but serve, <clears throat> uh, it says, his wife, his children, to serve others. <laughs> That's, that's the life I want, uh, a life of voluntary service out of love because I love my master. And so that's the, the thought that's being conveyed to us here. And so he says, by love, serve one another. We'll think about where this love comes from and some of the details in a moment. But this is what he's encouraging. By love, serve one another. And so he's, it's a beautiful analogy, uh, that uh, servant who is... Uh, set free by his master and yet volunteers to continue service because he loves his master. And of course, if we love our master and we love our wives and our children, um, the worst thing that we can do to them is let them see the flesh being fully indulged. <laughs> but instead, serving, being Christ-like in service is the best thing that they could ever see the most wonderful demonstration. So he says, by love, serve one another. Then he says this, verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So again, he's not advocating that we live lawless lives. In fact, he says all the laws fulfilled in this one word, you will love your neighbor as yourself. So he wants to show that Christian love is the fulfillment it is the carrying out of the the law and this is very consistent in paul's writing that love is the answer and so if you look back with me just for a second to the book of romans in chapter 13 we'll see that same thought conveyed um, and so <clears throat> romans 13 and we'll um, begin in verse 8 he says oh no man anything but to love one another for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law for this thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not kill thou shalt not steal thou shalt not bear false witness thou shalt not covet and if there be any other commandment it is briefly comprehended in this saying namely thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself love worketh no ill to his neighbor therefore love is the fulfilling of the law and so we might say this that what what we need what's needed is a heart full of love love for our master love for our fellow men and we might say well where does that come from <laughs> well we'll get an answer to that shortly that's what this passage is all about where is this love going to come from where where's where's the supply because by nature the the thing that we love the most is self <laughs> so where is this love going to come from and of course we know that the source of genuine christian love comes from the spirit romans 5 5 the love of god has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who was given unto us. We're going to see in this section, the fruit of the Spirit is, and what's the first word mentioned? Love. And so it's, it's a manifestation 
of the indwelling spirit enables us to love like this and so this is this is what fulfills the law it's this life of love out of this new life of love made possible within the christian community through the spirit the law finds fulfillment of course we might ask the question well who is my neighbor <laughs> that was asked once before wasn't it and and the simple answer from Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, we won't take the time to turn there, but we, we know the story of the Good Samaritan. And it really defines our neighbor as anyone who comes our way who needs help and assistance. <laughs> he was somebody, he, <laughs> he desperately needed somebody to help him. And love, who is my neighbor that I'm supposed to love? It was demonstrated by that selfless act of the good samaritan and so it helps us to realize uh, who do i love and uh, it's it, it it's it's the one that comes across my path the, this world desperately needs a demonstration of the love of christ uh, one thing that's so lacking in this world is genuine love and christian love is a powerful powerful thing and uh, of course, it is because it's given by the Spirit, and and it, so it's supernatural. It's not natural. It's not like the world loves. It's different. And so this love is the answer. And so he says, "Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself." And then he, and again, we just might say this. Maybe this is a good way of putting it: not law on the outside, but love on the inside is what makes the difference. I want you to think about that. See, that's the difference about Christianity. Legalism is all about external rules. The true life of the Christian is an internal life, that God does a miracle surgery within and changes us from the inside out. The Pharisees dressed up beautifully on the outside. Remember, the Lord said to them, outwardly they looked like white-walled sepulchres. Outside looked good, but he said, inside, <laughs> you're full of dead men's bones. What was inside? It was totally corrupt. <laughs> and so that's that's what religion does. Religion dresses up the outside. The religion makes the externals look good, but it doesn't really affect the inner man. But God's solution is, I'm going to change you. But you know, I'm going to do it. I'm going to change you from the inside out. <laughs> I'm going to change. I'm going to give you a heart surgery. You desperately need a new heart, <laughs> a new disposition. And, uh, and of course, that's what conversion and the giving of the spirit does. It makes us into new men. And oh, how thankful we are for that transformation. Um, but again, the spirit of God is the answer. And so the alternative, of course, is um we see it in verse um, 15 he says but so in contrast to this idea of the, the the love that is manifest kind of fulfilling the law by love serve one another he says but if ye bite and devour one another take heed that you be not consumed one of another he's using very graphic language it's a picture of a pack of wild animals tearing and devouring one another. Uh, the loveless life is a life lived on the level of animals with a concern only for oneself, no matter what it costs to other people. You, you hear the phrase, it's a dog eat dog world. <laughs> Have you ever heard that phrase? But it was interesting yesterday, like on my second flight, it was kind of dark and everybody's watching their screens at the back of their um, various machines. And just glancing around, the violence in almost whatever they were, I have no idea what people were watching. But I want to tell you, it wasn't, a, it wasn't love serving one another that was put on the screens. <laughs> it was people biting and devouring one another. And that's the way our world is. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and yet the Christian community has an opportunity to live a different life. And the tragedy is that in Galatia, <clears throat> there's internal strife. How did that get there? They were once united, but false teachers came in, 
and tried to put them back under the law. And you can imagine what was going on in the assembly. There were some that were buying into this and they were they felt they were right and there were others that were saying no this is not what paul taught us and they thought the other, and you can just see how uh, they were beginning to bite and devour one another and so there's this internal strife that is beginning to develop in the assembly because of the false doctrine that had come in and so they're beginning to bite and devour it would suggest unrestrained restrained abuse of one another acting more like animals than saints. And Paul is telling them, warning them actually, that there's a great danger that they're going to completely destroy the testimony. Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. And how many gathering of God's people, gatherings of God's people, have been torn apart by fleshly strife? People that once loved one another with a pure heart fervently can't bear the sight of one another. You see that in marriages, even Christian marriages. Isn't that amazing? When, when, when the flesh and strife come in, uh, something that was beautiful can turn into something very ugly and very hostile very, very quickly. And so this continual strife would lead to extinction of the testimony in Galatia. What we say is that whenever there's strife, Amalek, a picture of the flesh, always, always shows up. And Christians may have the best principles in the world. They may have the best uh, concern for truth in the world, but the, with the flesh comes in, um, it just, it makes the thing a killing field. It really does. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And so, like Ishmael and Isaac, in chapter 4, verse 23, that couldn't get on together, <laughs> uh, neither can uh, this conflict between uh, those that are going back under law, uh, fleshly kind of religion, rather than those that are by desiring, by love to serve one another, and it really leads to strife. So now we, we come to verse um, 16, and well, what, a, what a contrast this verse is to the previous verse. We've just seen about people acting like animals, tearing one another apart, God's people being torn asunder uh, by strife. And in verse uh, 16, we see, see this, this verse that is a marvelous promise. It really is. It says this, this I say then, Walk in the spirit, and now I want you to notice this, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is a promise of victory. This is a this is a verse for overcomers. This is how do you want to live a life where you're not constantly defeated by the flesh? Well, he says, you, if you want that, it's not by going back under law. Law will no in no wise stop you from from fulfilling the lust of the flesh that's not god's answer god's answer to the flesh is not the law the law reveals the flesh it actually brings out the flesh right it brings out the inner rebel in us we know that uh, when when we see don't touch the first thing in our minds is we want to touch it that's just the way it is where but in instead god said i've got a better solution my solution to the flesh is the spirit and so he says uh, and in fact, this section, let me just say this. I need to kind of give the big picture here. But from verse uh, 16 to the end of the chapter, down to verse 26, the Holy Spirit is mentioned seven times. Now, biblical numerology is an interesting thing, isn't it? And seven is the number of completeness and perfection. And what we could say here is this. God's perfect and complete answer to the tyranny of the flesh is found in the Spirit of God. <laughs> that's his answer. <clears throat> and that's a, and, and by the way, I just want to say this. It's kind of amazing to me how little teaching we give in our assemblies to the Spirit-filled life. 
how little attention is given and instructions about walking in the spirit. And if this is the solu- this is God's solution to the flesh that is terrorizing every one of us, why are we not hearing more about it? <laughs> why is it not being taught to new Christians who, who struggle with these things, to old Christians who, yes, believe it or not, the flesh doesn't improve with age, who need reminding of it? And so he says, thus I say then, walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, we mentioned Amalek in the previous kind of uh, little talk we were just talking about there. But I want you to go back with me to the book of Exodus 17, where we see Amalek showing up. <clears throat> Exodus 17, and it's a verse that, uh, again, it's very uh, important. Um, so... <clears throat> Let's just read from um, uh, verse, let's read from verse 8. Let's just do the whole little section here because it's really so important. It says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now, what's interesting is we, we won't take the time to look at it, but Deuteronomy 25 verse 17 tells us that Amalek's attack came against the stragglers. You know, you get to two to three million people marching through the desert and those that were right at the back and probably were tired and weary with their journey Amalek attacked them I just want to say this just from a practical standpoint that I have found that I have the most difficulty with the flesh when I'm really tired okay when I'm kind of weary with the journey that's when the flesh comes in and that's just how Amalek works it's when you're tired when you're weary and so it says Moses said to Joshua choose us out men and go fight and go out fight with Amalek tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with a rod of God in my hand and so here's a beautiful picture it's a picture of Moses interceding on the top of the mount on behalf of the battle that was going on down here down below in the valley and it's a beautiful picture of the fact that we have a high priest and an intercessor who is praying for us, whose hands never get weary. <laughs> he doesn't need somebody to prop up his uplifted hands, right? But he's praying for us. But isn't that wonderful, by the way? What? Let's just pause and just enjoy this thought that the Lord, even when we're weary, even when we're under attack, the Lord is praying for us. He's our high priest, our intercessor, at God's right hand, while we're fighting the battles down below, but in a sense we're going to see it's not us that's fighting the battles. We're going to learn something important here. But it says, So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And of course, have you ever tried that, lifting your hands up? <laughs> I don't know how our charismatic brethren do it for a long time, but it's uh, it gets weary. They become like lead weights if you keep your hands up for a long, long time. And that's what's happening to him. They, they, they t- uh, so they took a stone, put it under him. He sat there on it, and Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And again, notice that with Amalek, the way to deal with Amalek is to run Amalek through with the sword. Do you remember Ag- Agag in our, our study of Saul? <laughs> and uh, uh, Saul spared uh, uh, Agag and the best of the flesh, uh, or the, the best of the sheep, and uh, and how um, Samuel hacked Agag to pieces. The idea is this. You cannot play around with the flesh. It has to be dealt with drastically. 
and it, <laughs> we have to cut it to pieces, as it were. So Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. The Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. By the way, that's a glorious promise. That's why we look forward to the rapture, not just to escape the tribulation period, but also the fact that the, the remembrance of Amalek, the flesh, is utterly going to be removed in that glorious day. And we will love the Lord with an unsinning heart and the flesh will never be remembered again. <laughs> That's, oh, wow, what a what a blessed hope that is. Isn't that amazing? Uh, what, what, no wonder we look for his appearing. Uh, so verse 15, Moses built an altar called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner. He said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war. Now notice this, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek. For years, I read that as we will have war with Amalek, as if I'm fighting the flesh. <laughs> you can't fight flesh with flesh. It doesn't work. They're both the same. Religious flesh, as we'll see when we look at the works of the flesh and rotten flesh, there is absolutely no difference. It's still the flesh. You do not fight flesh with flesh. So it says the Lord, and, I, and could I put it in New Testament language, the Lord, the Spirit, will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And the reason I say that is when we go back to our passage in Galatians 5, and this is why this is such a necessary background here. He says that if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for, connection, the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary, the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you would. So you get the picture here. The battle is between the flesh and the Spirit. That's The Lord, the Spirit, will always have war with Amalek. Uh, and so that's that's the picture he wants to convey to us. And so the spirit in many characteristic passages is really revealed to be the presence of God in the man uh, through which fellowship with God is made possible and power is given for this battle against the flesh. Because the spirit is not natural to man in his fallen state, this reception of the spirit occurs at conversion. Remember, he reminded them in chapter 3, uh, how did you, uh, verse 2, this only would I learn of you, receive you the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. And so the spirit comes into us at conversion. Now, the the, the presence of the spirit is no guarantee that we're going to enjoy victory. It's not his presence that's going to, not the fact that he's resident that's going to give us victory. What's going to give us victory is when he is president. You see, I would say this, the spirit of God is resident in every believer, but he's not president in every believer. And it's when we learn to walk in the spirit, that the idea is that it's under his complete control that is when we enjoy this victory and do not fulfill the lust of the flesh so the the gift of the indwelling spirit to a redeemed man does not mean we escape the struggle with sin it the spirit simply makes victory possible and only to the degree in that the believer walks in the spirit that idea of walk is is a pr present tense and it points to a continuing condition and need for it day by day some people put it this way keeping in step with the spirit just moment by moment this dependent life depending on the spirit because paul said in my flesh dwells no good thing it's totally beyond redemption god has no plans to improve my flesh none whatsoever his only solution to the flesh is crucifixion. <laughs> All that I was in Adam has to be crucified. What, what I need to do is live in moment-by-moment -moment dependence of the Holy Spirit. 
if the flesh is not allowed to indulge its repulsive side, it will indulge its religious side. The flesh is a great doer. It always wants to be doing something, <laughs> either either doing something religiously or doing something um, for dirt. It likes to feed on dirt, basically. It loves dirt. But, but if it can't find dirt to feed on, it will feed the religious flesh. <laughs> and so uh, it's all about doing. Uh, it's another way of putting us under the law. And so we've just got to recognize this importance of walking in the flesh. Keep on walking in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Moment by moment, dependence on our indwelling heavenly guest to enable us to live a life of victory. It's a matter of yielding to his control, making ourselves available to him moment by moment. One person said, and I like this, when Romans 12, 1, when you present your body a living sacrifice, well, God doesn't need a body because he's a spirit. God is spirit, right? He doesn't need a body. The Lord Jesus already has a body. So who is it that we're to give up, present our body's living sacrifice to? I believe the idea is this, yield it fully to the Holy Spirit for him to control. That's the thought. Give yourself fully to the Spirit of God and allow him to manifest the life of Christ through you. Walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill. Absolute promise, the lust of the flesh. And then, of course, this, this conflict going on between the flesh and the Spirit. They're contrary one to another. I suppose what we could say is the, the, the thought of the eradication of the old nature is a pipe dream. <laughs> uh, this flesh and spirit in conflict is a perpetual thing until the rapture, until that old man will be done away with. So the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, these are contrary the one to another, so you cannot do the things that you would. Just like Ishmael and Isaac, the two just can't get along. And by the way, we can we see that right to this very hour, don't we? <laughs> uh, the descendants of Ish Ishmael and Isaac don't get on so well either. And, and so we could see, just as Ishmael and Isaac don't get on, flesh and spirit don't get on either. Uh, there's, <clears throat> and so uh, the strength of the indwelling spirit is available. So there's no need for us to yield to the desires of the flesh. We do not have to carry out the flesh's promptings. Instead, we can yield ourselves moment by moment to the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, then there's the leading of the Spirit. In verse 18, it says, But if ye be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. And so, again, the idea of being led is you're putting yourself under somebody's leadership. You're allowing somebody to take the lead. Who's leading? Are you leading or is he leading? The leading of the spirit is very, very important. And um, uh, so it's important in Galatians, um, just as justification is not possible by works, so sanctification cannot be achieved by human effort either. And this we're not encouraging kind of a total passivity, but what we're saying is that everything really depends on faith. The just shall live by his faith. So our initial justification, how did that occur? We realized I can't save myself. I have to depend on the work of another, the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary, in order to be saved, to be declared righteous. Because I realize there's nothing good in me. I'm, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. But how to live the Christian life? If faith in Christ is necessary to save me, faith in the holy indweller is necessary to sanctify me, to live a holy life. It's a life of faith from start to finish. And so the idea is this, before you put your feet on the floor in the morning, it's good to say to yourself, Lord, I can't live this Christian life. Even my best flesh can't do this. <laughs> I need the Spirit of God to live 
the life of Christ through me. I need to yield fully to his control today. And then maybe at different pauses during the day, we need to remind ourselves, recalibrate, because it's we're so used to, don't, don't forget that before you were saved, all you ever did was follow the dictates of the flesh. He had complete dominion for all of your life, and then suddenly you get saved, and, and he's calling back to you and saying, come on, remember, you, you served me all these years. Give in, you know, do it again. You know how good it feels, you know? And so so we have to say, uh, no, I'm under under new management now. I have a different, I have a different manager, <laughs> and I'm going to yield to his control. I want him to lead, to be led by the Spirit. Now, it's often used in relation to uh, worship. You know, we've seen it at the remembrance meeting. And, and it's a beautiful thing, by the way, isn't it? When, you, when you're in a meeting you know, and it's so obvious that the Spirit of God is leading in the meeting. He's just directing. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, it, so we know that it works there uh, or he works there. Uh, we, we've seen it in ministry. Uh, Lord laying on a, a man's heart to speak on a subject and he gives this message and and people come up afterwards and they say, who told you? Like, how did you know? <laughs> and of course, it's the leading of the Spirit. He gave the right message for the right occasion. Uh, you see it in the gospel. Uh, somebody be led to share a verse that seems so weird and obscure. You think, how could anybody ever get saved out of that verse? But it's just the right verse that that person needed to hear. And you, you're even surprised yourself that you you said that verse like like why would you use that in a you know in other words there's no canned way of witnessing as we are led by the spirit he may cause us to use a verse that you're even surprised yourself how could anyone and it's just what they need to hear so we we've 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 know something of this leading of the spirit and it's a beautiful beautiful thing but what he's saying here is it's not just in the meetings <laughs> It should be every single moment of every single day to be led by the Spirit. We want him to lead us, him to be in control. Um, and I would suggest to you that the more he's in control in the mundane things of life, the more he will show up in those special occasions. It's the idea of this, I'm under new management and I have new leadership and I want him to be the one who leads me. And of course, not always easy. I just I think it's good to just look back at Luke's gospel, chapter four. I, I can't help but making the connection uh, with the Lord himself or Jesus in Luke's gospel presented to us as uh, that second man, the last Adam, the dependent man. And said before, there's more about his personal prayer life in Luke than any other gospel because he's the dependent man. He's showing his dependence. But also, there's more about his relationship with the Spirit of God. In Luke 4, 1, Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, and notice it says, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, I want you to notice that. Sometimes the leading of the Spirit may lead us into deep trials, People go to the mission field and the Lord leads them to a certain place. And it seems like it's a disaster. Uh, they read about people. I'm trying to think who was I reading about uh, in Burma. Patton, was it? Who, who was the guy that went to Burma? Anyway, it doesn't matter. But but it just trial after trial after trial. But by the end of it all, there's like 9,000 believers. There's churches everywhere that are still going to this day. Uh, it, it, so it, it it may not be, the leading of the spirit may not lead us into into uh, easy situations. The Lord was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, but notice verse fourteen: Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit, and then in verse eighteen, as he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth, Nazareth he says, "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me." He has anointed me to preach the gospel. And so I just want you just to simply get the idea of this, that the Lord Jesus, as man, he knew what it was to be led by the Spirit. The Lord Jesus, as man, knew what it was to walk in the Spirit. The Lord Jesus, as man, knew what it was to experience the fullness of the Spirit and also the power of the Spirit 
and he was anointed of the spirit in fact i i would suggest to you that there's no person no man that ever walked this earth that was more dominated by the spirit of god than the lord jesus and so what i would say is if if we are christians christ ones what do you think god's plan is for us as men <laughs> mankind do you think that it would be god's plan for us to like live like he lived in complete dependence on the leading of the spirit i think that would be obvious wouldn't it and yet how little attention is given to this and so he says walk in the spirit you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh there's this conflict if you're led by the spirit notice he says verse 18 if you're led by the spirit you are not under the law i find that really interesting the spirit will never lead you back to sinai ever right you are led by the spirit you're not under law he's not going to lead you back there these galatians this this move back to law is not the leading of the spirit it's all flesh is religious flesh at work here it's not the leading of the spirit he will never ever lead you to sinai he'll always lead you to calvary he loves to glorify christ he wants you to see uh, that the, he's the end of the law for righteousness to those that believe he wants you to see the glories of the son of son of god and so you're not under the law and so to be led of the spirit is so so important it's interesting how he's placing the flesh and the law on the same platform here the spirit who fights against the flesh <clears throat> never leads us back to law it's kind of interesting and of course this would have been very striking to the galatians to to hear him making these contrasts so then he goes on in verse 19 and he talks to us about the flesh he wants us to just sometimes it's good now this is this is going to be the most much more unpleasant where we're moving into an unpleasant section but sometimes we need to see how ugly the flesh is we just need a graphic picture of its ugliness and i, I think it's a, to me i love the contrast between <clears throat> this section uh, notice it says the works of the flesh and then <clears throat> Further on, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And I like to just make this little contrast or comparison. I don't know why it just fills my heart to do it. But I think of the flesh as a factory. It's it's manufacturing the works of the flesh. We used to, you know, it, in the olden days, we used to talk about going down to the iron works or going down to, and it was the idea of manufacturing and activity and busyness and all the rest of it but it's churning out pollution. So I want you to get this picture, you know, kind of industrial revolution. Here's this factory, kind of black smoke coming out of the chimney. I remember going back to my uh, home city of Leeds and growing up there, it was the center of the clothing industry in the British Isles. And uh, yeah, suits, if you wanted a suit, usually it was made in Leeds. Uh, in fact, a lot of my aunts used to work in the in the factories there. And there was a, a lot of pollution. And so Leeds City Hall used to be black. And I grew up in this black building. Big building, magnificent looking, but it was just black. And then one day, I went back to there to visit, and it was sandstone. And it looked gorgeous. And what they did is they'd power washed all the, all the pollution off it. And so just get this picture. The flesh is just a dirt producing pollution producing factory that is tirelessly producing all of these things <laughs> all polluting all corrupting all horrible on the other hand the fruit of the spirit now we're looking at a beautiful orchard with with just rich with fruit <laughs> isn't that a, just a, an amazing contrast between the two scenes and so and of course that that fruit it, how does it get there it's just it's abiding it's just abiding getting its nourishment its life 
uh, from from the vine, from the tree, if you like. And so the idea of this is that our flesh, it's a it's a producer. <clears throat> it it produces a lot of filth, feeds on filth, produces filth, pollutes, corrupts, it's dirty, defiling every single way. On the other hand, fruit of the spirit is delicious, luscious fruit. <laughs> And it's the fruit of an abiding life, of a dependent life, of of drawing resources from another place, <laughs> from the spirit, the indwelling spirit of God. And so it's, it's a lovely picture that we have to somehow fasten in our minds. And so <clears throat> some people have helpfully, I think, um, this this graphic list have divided it into sections. And so we, the first section is sexual sin, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And then there's religious sins, which would be envying, uh, sorry, would be uh, idolatry and witchcraft. And then some people have said, well, there are social sins, uh, which would be hatred, variance, uh, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, her heresies, envyings, murders, and then sins of excess, which would be drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And it's sometimes helpful to have those divisions, although we have to say that they're not so clear-cut as it first seems. So let me just say what I mean by that. Adultery is clearly a sexual sin, but it's also a social sin. Think of the devastation it causes in marriages right it, it it affects relationships it, it has social implications often uh, adultery if it continues on often causes divorce and the social implications of marriage breakup on children is very serious right so so it yes it is a sexual sin of that there's no question but there are huge social implications. So in one sense, it's also a social sin. So I just wanted to say, I, I think they're helpful designations, but there's a lot of interconnectivity and a lot of overlap with these things. So we'll just look at verse 19 and, and complete, uh, as it were, the section that uh, we read, and then we'll, we'll pause for our question and answer session or comments. But uh, I just want you to notice uh, he says the, the works of the flesh are manifest. That is, they're open, obvious, well-known, open to view, visible. <laughs> In other words, the flesh, it produces, and what it produces is evident for everybody to see. You, 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 this is what's behind it. And, and it is interesting that sometimes, you know, we, we use all kinds of excuses, we blame things, but at the end of the day, it's just a person is being dominated by their flesh. They've given into the flesh. And, and so when that happens, that's what's been happening. It's, it, it, and it's not, and it didn't just happen. And so the idea of adultery, we would say this, somebody that commits adultery, that just didn't happen in a vacuum, in an instant, in a moment. They've been thinking about that for a long time. Maybe not necessarily with that particular person, but in you remember how the Lord says, if you've looked on a woman to lust after you, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. So it, it all begins in the heart before it's ever manifested in the life. And so what we're saying is this, that this ultimately it will be manifested. You know, it, it'll come out. <laughs> uh, the flesh manifests itself. It, it does it, show, it shows itself on the outward, but it really is, it's not just this one act of adultery, but here's a man and a woman, and the, they're controlled, dominated by their flesh. They're not under the control of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would never lead a man to betray his covenant with his wife, ever. It's never the work of the Spirit. You can put all the spiritual spin on it you want to, but it's just spin. <laughs> That's all it is. The end of the day, it's just spin. It's not true. It's the works of the flesh. And so adultery. So we said adultery is a sexual sin. 
It's also a social sin. It's a betrayal of family and of trust and of vows. And it's a very serious thing. And uh, again, we, we sadly, uh, the Christian community has not been immune from adulterous relationships. Got to be honest. It goes on in the world all the time, but sadly it goes on amongst the people of God. And so, again, we just need to realize that why, why does it happen amongst God's people? We've got to remind ourselves, being indwelt by the Spirit is not the same as being controlled by the Spirit or being walking in the Spirit. And so, no doubt, the Spirit is deeply, deeply grieved when these kind of things take place. But ultimately, this is what the flesh produces. The works of the flesh are these, adultery. And then fornication. Now, it's uh, much wider, this word, than, than just adultery. It's sexual sin in its widest aspect. It's the word that comes from the ancient Greek word porneo, which we get our idea of pornography, sexual immorality in a broad sense. Uh, it started out meaning uh, the use of a prostitute in Greek etymology. It started out by meaning the use of a prostitute, but by Paul's day, it was used for a, a wide variety of sexual sin. It, it, it covers illicit connection between single or unmarried persons, yet often signifies adultery as well. So, for instance, in 1 Corinthians, um, the sin of uh, 1 Corinthians 5, and we'll just look there, but it's just interesting. Um, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you. Such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So is that just fornication or is there adultery there? Well, if he's having his father's wife, that means his father was married, <laughs> right? So yeah, it's, it seems wider than just adultery, um, and uh, it, but it includes adultery. That's what I would say. Voluntary sexual intercourse between two unmarried persons or two persons not married to each other uh, includes sex before and outside of marriage, which Paul calls fornication. Um, so widespread that it was accepted as normal in Paul's day and sadly is accepted as normal in our day. And um, Paul can't accept any of these practices at all. He says it is totally wrong. The Holy Spirit would never lead anyone into fornication. And then he says on cleanness and uh, I remember in, in the workplace, um, almost anything you said, there were people that would turn it into dirt. The most innocent statement, they would find some way of making dirt out of it. And so the uncleanness is, is, is the idea of innuendos. It's kind of the idea of making something dirty out of just everyday speak. They always find some way of making it dirty. And then lasciviousness, and this is... a, a a good way to end in some ways that uh, lascivious is no shame, openly wicked with no restraint. The one who shocks public decency, who knows no restraint um, in his lack of self-control, gives free play to his sinful desires, not caring what others think. Uh, <clears throat> Somebody who's an unclean person, I mean, they bring it up in conversation, but generally they may hide their sin. But somebody who's lascivious, he's not interested in hiding it. He flaunts it. He's in your face with his perverted ways. And, of course, we see a lot of that today, don't we? Uh, the gay pride parades, all these kind of things where people are flaunting defiantly uh, not caring about public opinion actually sadly public opinion is now in there is in favor of their perversion for the most part it seems but initially it wasn't but these people were lascivious in the sense that they were shameless 
uh, animal lust, enslaved to sheer self-indulgence, shocking outrage. That is lasciviousness. And again, it's all part of what the flesh factory produces. And I just want to say this in closing, that in the flesh, if you're dominated by your flesh, even though you're a believer, you are capable of anything. And I think that if you ever get to the point where you think, oh, I could never do that, you'd be deceived. Because in your flesh dwells no good thing. Now, it would be very grieving to the Holy Spirit. Uh, you would have to, your conscience would have to become quite seared. But nevertheless, it's a capability. And sadly, we all know instances and stories that could back this up. On the other hand, this is a good way to finish. Brethren, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us be led by the Spirit. Let us be people that what's evident is the beautiful fruit of Christ-likeness rather than the polluting, corrupting influences of the flesh. And that would so glorify the Savior. Amen.